very much for coming, um, especially at this point in the campaign when there is nine days to go and all the campaigning that we've done over the last two years suddenly feels really real and um, it was Dumfries and Galloway, Radical Independence was one of the first local groups that got set up um, from Radical Independence and the work that's been done is absolutely brilliant. Um, as Janet already said, we shared a platform together what seems like a long, long time ago, just how far the campaigns come. And I've been obviously following um, the, the stories on independence that have been happening in the, in the press the last few days, and all I see is wall-to-wall -wall panic from the No campaign. Always born saying more powers, Darlin saying no more powers, or maybe some. And it's kind of hard to keep track. Um, the Queen being outed as a unionist, who knew? Um, and even the right-wing media are in complete disarray. They're in complete disarray. I don't know if anyone read Alan Cochran's um, latest column and um, where he is imploring, begging no voters to find a scrap piece of A4 paper in their house and a crayon and if they know how to spell the word no, make their own sign to compete with the thousands of yes signs that are going in people's windows. And I think that it seems like they really thought that this would never happen. And for me, it's not just a, an ignorance, it's not just a symbol of how far that political establishment has got from the ordinary people in Scotland and in the rest of the UK. It's, it's more than that. I think it's a goddamn arrogance that they thought that this would never happen. And now we see this huge movement towards yes, this huge movement for the yes campaign, and they're beginning to wobble. And it's not the threat of the SNP getting into power, and it's not the threat of Labour recovering its radical roots, it's the threat of a genuine people's movement. And this campaign has not been about flags. It's not been about political parties. It's not a debate about blood and soil nationalism. It's about all those things that the last two speakers have spoken about, democracy, social justice, an end to British military aggression, and the ending of the waste of billions and billions of pounds on nuclear weapons. And like I said, it's fundamentally not been about political parties and it's not politics as normal, and I think that that's what the establishment really, really don't know how to deal with. I can only imagine how they're going to feel on the 19th, by the way. <laughs> but tonight, I don't, I, want, I don't want to talk about the affordability of independence, because of course it is. All the arguments are out there. You know, you've got Nobel Prize winning economists telling us, of course, this is financially viable. And I don't want to make promises that are just based on white paper, because as a socialist, I think we can and should go further. Tonight, I want to talk about risks and what's at stake and the risks, but not of a yes vote, the risks of voting no. And I want to start with a quote from a newspaper. It's a quote that I'm sure some of you will have heard before, and it starts, how much of Scotland's economy will be left intact if a Scottish Assembly gets the go-ahead? And it's a quote from an editorial piece in the Daily Express prior to the referendum in 1979 for a Scottish Assembly. And it was the same scaremongering tactics that they used then that the No campaign are trying to use now. How much of the Scottish economy will be left intact? And the quote continues, will our coal mines go gaily on? Will Ravens Craig or Linwood thrive? Well, we know what happened. The coal mines shut. And from 1980 to 1995, Linwood had the highest rates of unemployment in Scotland as 13,000 jobs were lost in car manufacturing. Families were ripped apart. It's not just an economic argument. Families were torn apart as men and women struck out to other parts of Scotland to look for work. Some went to London, some emigrated to Canada, to Australia. And people in this referendum talk about capital flight what happens if all the rich people leave? What happens if that, if that phenomenon occurs? Well, I think this is far more dangerous. The hemorrhaging of our greatest natural resource, our people. And as for Ravenscraig, well, I'm originally from Hamilton, and I will never, ever forget the moment that I stood on top of the hill where we used to live in a park with my mum and my dad and our neighbours and all the other people from Hamilton that came up because it was a really, really good viewpoint. And we watched the chimneys come down, and we watched all the disintegration of that profitable industry happen in front of us. And for me, that's become a symbol of what Thatcher did to Scotland, 
destroyed our profitable industries, ripped families and communities apart to pay for the City of London. And if there was to be a no vote in nine days' time, we cannot for a second trust that obscene and arrogant elite at Westminster to somehow reward us with some little scraps from their table. They didn't in 1979 and they won't this time. There is £25 billion worth of cuts yet to come, and that's regardless of whether we get a Tory government or a Labour government. There is a cross-party consensus for spending billions more on keeping Trident. And the whole failure of the British electoral system, if there's a no vote in 2015, it will push Labour and Tories to compete for those same middle class, middle England seats, those swing votes that they say, if you win them, you win the government. And as they're fighting that battle, I have no doubt about it. It will be funding to Scotland that's on the chopping block again. And it will be people in Scotland that pay the price once more. And during this campaign, when I've been talking to people from other parts of the UK or even people in Scotland who are saying, we can't, we can't leave England with a Tory government, that's what will happen. And there's plenty of sources that disprove that, that talk about the influence of the Scottish vote. But I think it's quite interesting to turn that around and look at Scottish voting patterns, because it is 59 years since Scotland returned a Tory majority. And for more than half that time, we've endured Conservative rule at Westminster. Based on that, we can expect Tory governments for what? One out of every two parliaments. Voting no locks us into Tory governments. Voting no locks us in to more cuts. And I think that that is a very, very bleak picture. But we've got something else. We've got a way out. And there is hope. I think this whole campaign for a yes vote has been incredible. It's actually done something quite spectacular. And that's before we even go into that ballot box. It hasn't been divisive. It hasn't been, because see, before this campaign, I didn't know my neighbours. I didn't know my community. All these wee groups that have sprung up in communities across Scotland, going out canvassing, asking people, have they decided how they're going to vote? You know, asking people, have you made up your mind? You get to know the people that live around you. This whole campaign has started to rebuild what Thatcher destroyed and detested. It has started to rebuild our social solidarity. And I'm, I'm very interested in that concept of solidarity and what that means. I'm a trade unionist, um, and I'm very proud of that. And I think solidarity is important. Of course it is in this campaign. And I care deeply about what happens to people not just in Scotland, not just in the rest of the UK, but across the world as well. But in this referendum campaign, when we go into the ballot box, we can offer people in England, Wales and Northern Ireland one of only two gifts. And one of them is an extra around about 40-ish Labour MPs to join the Westminster ranks for one out of every two parliaments. You know, if it's a Labour majority, maybe they'll form government. Or these Labour MPs that we've sent down who voted for Tory policies like the welfare cap. The other thing that we can offer is the chance for a social democratic project in Scotland. A chance to have a new type of society where all our ideas, the ideas from radical independence, the ideas from the Green Party, from Women for Independence, from Commonweal, from all these groups that have sprung up around this campaign, somewhere where those ideas can become realities. The 18th of September is a chance. That's all it is. It's a chance. It opens up a little gap in the system that has reproduced misery and despair for so many people. And it is an opportunity for us to unpick the fabric that binds us into the type of society that we have now, to unpick all of that and to restitch it the way we want to see it. And this entire no campaign has been run on fear. And I think that is a disgraceful way to run an entire campaign for two years to make people in Scotland attempt to make them afraid of their own right to self-determination. And I do have fears. And I'm afraid that in years to come, people will still be standing up talking about children suffering from poverty, 
elderly people that die year on year in an energy rich country, that families will still be torn apart by joblessness and that there will be generation after generation of young people who have no say in their own destiny. I have no fear of an independent Scotland. I'm only afraid of more of the same. And there is an urgency now. In nine days' time, if there is a yes vote, we will begin to dismantle some of the most reactionary and backwards elements of the British state. And I get goosebumps when I think about that possibility. In nine days, we walk into a ballot box that gives us a way out of our current situation. So let's go out after tonight's meeting, and it's great that everyone's come, but after tonight's meeting, let's go out and convince as many people as we can. Speak to your bus driver, um, the person in the news agents, you know, your family, your colleagues, your friends, everyone that you possibly can speak to. Have that conversation. I think it's an incredible privilege to be able to go out and ask people, what sort of country do you want? Let's go out and convince as many people as we can that another Scotland isn't now just possible, but it is increasingly probable. Thank you.